Nightcast. Stephen Lloyd Gilbreth brings you the current news from the world today and how it relates to Bible prophecy. Understanding the end time events leading to the peaceful world tomorrow. Ladies and gentlemen, Stephen Lloyd Gilbreth. Greetings, friends, and welcome to this January 25, 2015 edition of Nightcast. Our opening story for tonight, friends, comes out of Europe. The European Central Bank is planning on pumping 1.1 trillion euros into the Eurozone. Money, euros. The European Central Bank today decided there's not enough of them, so it's creating more than a trillion new euros to add some oomph, it hopes, to the Eurozone's flatlining economy. For this man, the European Central Bank's president, Mario Draghi, it was his biggest, boldest attempt yet to get money flowing again to the businesses and consumers who badly need it. Businesses like this struggling Spanish distributor of cables. With a business plan or a good idea, it will be impossible to have access to the credit at the moment. The banks in Spain, they don't want to accept any risk at all. 60 billion euros of new money will be created, magicked up every month by the European Central Bank. Those euros will then be used to buy bonds, debts, IOUs, with much of the buying being done by central banks in national capitals. And they'll mostly be buying government bonds. Now, with all these new euros being created, money and credit becomes cheaper. That means lower interest rates for the government, businesses and households. And with the euro falling in price relative to other currencies, eurozone exports become cheaper in foreign markets all of which should give the Eurozone's economy a bit of a boost. Thank you so much for doing this. What's the verdict of the finance minister of Italy, which is still in recession? Is your view that Mario Draghi and the European Central Bank have been ambitious enough? It will be a key element of a general strategy. It will uh, push away any risk of deflation, which is there. It will provide an injection of confidence to markets. It will boost liquidity with companies and households. But this is just one element of the strategy we need to do more and use all the other policy tools we have at our disposal. But what's wrong is not just about a shortage of cheap money. Some of the Eurozone's big members have private sectors seen as weak and public sectors seen as bloated. And what's wrong there matters to the UK and its Chancellor. How big a contribution to the Eurozone recovery, a recovery which plainly matters to us since it's still our biggest export market, how big a contribution do you think to that recovery this programme of QE will make? I think the central bank can help, but it is not by itself enough. Uh, we've had help in the past from our central bank, but we accompanied that with a clear economic plan. So on the European continent, we have, yes, action from the European Central Bank, what we need to see is the countries of the European continent taking the action to make their economies stronger alongside them. So, a bit of an uphill struggle for the Eurozone. I think when QE first started in the UK and the US, it was a bit like a powerful antibiotic designed to cure a really serious problem. Today in the Eurozone, and maybe over the last year or so in Japan, it's a bit like a, a kind of an addictive painkiller. It's nice to be on. It doesn't necessarily cure the underlying disease. At the top of a Swiss mountain, where political and business leaders are meeting at the World Economic Forum, there's a hope that all this money creation will cause a thaw in the Eurozone's long, cold winter. Robert Peston, BBC News, in Davos, Switzerland. Friends of the European Central Bank, they're creating of more than a 1.1 trillion euros, which will be injected into the Eurozone economy is being done in a bid to revive it, revive the euro and it from its troubles. The technique they're using, known as quantitative easing, had been widely expected and was, and was used by Britain and the United States after the global financial cra uh, crash of 2008. Some think it may prove ineffective or have unintended consequences, according to BBC's economics editor, Robert Preston, who you heard in this video reporting from the World Economic Forum in Switzerland. Now, I don't have video for it, but on Friday, Bank of England's governor, Mark Carney, 
uh, welcomed the ECB, the European Central Bank's 1.1 trillion stimu uh, euro stimulus, as he called it. Uh, the governor of the Bank of England welcomed the European Central Bank's decision to roll out a $1.1 trillion, that's the equivalent of 834 billion pounds uh, stimulus package. And, you know, the pound's a little bit ahead of the uh, dollar, so just in general numbers, that's about a half million United States dollars in equivalency. Let's see, am I saying that right? Yeah. Um, Mark Carney, no, wait a minute, that, that'd, be, that'd be more like a million dollars in United States dollars because it takes more United States dollars to buy a, a British pound. In fact, it almost takes about twice as many. So that's probably more like a million and a half United, uh, a, a billion and a half United States dollars. Because if I said that correctly, that's the 1.1 trillion euros is the equivalent of 834 billion British pound sterlings. Mark Carney said the quantitative easing, quote, creates conditions for medium term, medium term prosperity. He added that it was important that inflation happened in the right spot as it risked hurting, quote, the poor more than anyone else. He was speaking at the BBC World Debate at the World Economic Forum in Davos, Switzerland. And friends, I have video with uh, the European Central Bank President, um, the uh, Draghi, who has announced that the European Central Bank, the ECB, will inject billions of euros into the ailing eurozone economy. The ECB will purchase bonds worth more than $60 billion per month until the end of September 2016 and possibly longer. Let's hear from the uh, European Bank President Mario uh, Draghi explaining the reasons behind his decision to implement quantitative easing, QE. Today's monetary policy decision on additional asset purchases was taken to counter two unfavorable developments. First, inflation dynamics have continued to be weaker than expected. While the sharp fall in oil prices over recent months remains the dominant factor driving current headline inflation, the potential for second round effects on wage and price setting has increased and could adversely affect medium term price developments. This assessment is underpinned by a further fall in market based measures of inflation expectations over all horizons. And the fact that most indicators of actual or expected inflation stand at or close to their historical lows. At the same time, economic slack in the euro area remains sizable, and money and credit developments will continue to be subdued. Second, while the monetary policy measures adopted between June and September last year resulted in a material improvement in terms of financial market prices, this was not the case for the quantitative results. As a consequence, the prevailing degree of monetary accommodation was insufficient to adequately address heightened risks of too prolonged a period of low inflation. Thus, today, the adoption of further balance sheet measures has become warranted to achieve our price stability objective, given that the key ECB interest rates have reached their lower bound. Friends, the Greeks went to polls today, and with much of the population 
still suffering following the country's economic woes, there is speculation. And in fact, more than speculation. The numbers are that have come in so far have, have, have uh, got the Syriza party well in the lead. The speculation was that the anti-austerity party Syriza could win. And it from the, so far, uh, at this point in the day, enough numbers are in, it's looks like Syriza has won. The BBC's Mark Lowen visited a market in Athens and spoke to one trader who would not reveal how he would vote, but he said that he wanted to see change in his country. This is, of course, where the Eurozone financial crisis first erupted four and a half years ago, and, and we're still talking about all these problems of recession and austerity and bailouts. Look at this lovely market here, these olives on sale. How more Greek can you get than that? Fantastic vegetables and fruit here. It looks lively. It looks healthy. It looks like business is doing well, but actually beneath the surface, it's a very, very sad picture indeed. Unemployment over 25%. Uh, pensions and salaries have been cut by 40%. People are really struggling, and that is why they are still contemplating uh, voting for something completely new. Let's talk to uh, Stathis here, who is selling the lovely cured meats at this market. Stathis, uh, how do you feel about what, the situation at the moment? How has austerity affected you? The situation is pretty bad at the, moment, at the moment. The economy is not going very well, and we're waiting for the elections. Uh, we hope that Monday is going to be a better day for our country here. Have you decided who you're going to vote for in the election on Sunday? Yes, of course I do have, but I, I, really, I don't really want to talk about it. I don't want to tell you what I'm going to do. All I want is uh, to change the whole situation. What needs to change? To change the whole thing, the economy problem we have here in Greece. We're waiting, and we, all we want is from Europe is to let us decide what we want for our future, to let us vote freely. That's because uh, they, you feel they're putting pressure on, on Greece to yeah, vote a, a certain way? pressure, and you know the reason why. Because of the money we need from the euro. Okay, Stathis, thank you very much indeed. Well, Europe has indeed given Greece 230 billion euros over the years. So uh, there is a feeling from Berlin, from Brussels, from other countries in Europe that they want Greece to stick to its current path. But really here, people are willing to try something new. So desperate are they. And tomorrow, why? The Greek Party Scares EU Leaders. Next, let's take a look at why Germany's Chancellor Angela Merkel says Greece should stay in the Eurozone. Uh, Germany's Chancellor Angela Merkel calls on voters to stay with Europe. The caption under this photograph with this story, friends, reads, supporters of Syriza back its call for change at pre-election rally in Athens. Change, it almost sounds like they're running on the old platform for uh, President Barack, that President Barack Obama ran on. Change. The uh, German Chancellor on Friday, this past Friday, she wants Greece to remain part of our story, quote, unquote. She said this ahead of elections that occurred today that, that could cast doubt over the country's future in the Eurozone. Angela Merkel called for unity on the last day of political campaigning, which was this past Friday. Both Syriza and the New Democracy Party held their final rallies later on Friday. The possibility of a left-wing Syriza victory in today's Sunday's vote has sparked fears that Greece could default on its debt and exit from the euro. Mrs. Merkel urged the country to remain a part of the eurozone when she spoke on Friday. At the heart of our principles lies solidarity, she said during a news conference in Florence with Italian Prime Minister Matteo Renzi, who you see pictured here. And the caption under this picture, well, it just repeats basically what I've said. Chancellor Merkel was speaking at a news conference with Italian Prime Minister 
Matteo Renzi. I want Greece, despite the difficulties, to remain part of our story. And we, friends, because the German story is we want to rule the world. We've always wanted to rule the world. And our, all our efforts so far have met with frustration against our goal of ruling the world. But just give us half a chance. We'll keep trying to rule the world. And where you and other countries out there are crazy enough to help us get in a position to do that, to rule the world, well, we'll take the best of what you have to offer. And then when we've got everything just right, we'll have you uh, be our slaves if we decide to leave you alive. That, friends, is the history of the Assyrians, who are your modern-day Germans, Germans, wonderful, lovely people. They, they make great beer, and their women are very beautiful, at least very charming, as you can see in the teddy bear manners of Chancellor Angela Merkel. Speaking to crowds of supporters on Thursday night last week, Syriza's leader, Alexis Tsipras, repeated his promise to have half of Greece's international debt written off when the current bailout deal ends. He said an end to national humiliation was near. As opinion poll, polls showed the party in, in, uh, in the lead with just days to go until the vote, the voting today. Greece has endured deep budget cuts tied to its massive bailout from so-called Troika, the EU International Monetary Fund and European Central Bank. The caption with this picture that's part of this story, friends, reads, The Greek Economy in Numbers. And here are the numbers. The average wage in Greece is 600 euros. That's the equivalent of 400 British pounds sterlings or 690 United States dollars in the equivalents of, 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 of our money per month. 600 euros, 690 U.S. dollars or 450 British pounds sterlings per month. Unemployment is at 25% with youth unemployment almost 60%. The economy has shrunk by 25% since the start of the Eurozone crisis. And note this point, the country's debt, are you listening to this? The country's debt is 175% of its GDP, its gross domestic product. The rule in the EU is to keep your, your debt ratio to your gross domestic product within 3%. They're way, way over 3%, 175% of gross domestic product. That's why they're in such trouble. And the, the austerity thing is extreme because from 3% to 175%, that's a huge, huge number. They borrowed... 240 billion pounds, I'm sorry, not pounds, euros. They borrowed 240 billion euros in pounds. That would be the, the equivalent of about 188 billion British pound sterlings and considerably more than that in United States dollars. I didn't quite work out that exact equivalent, but you get the idea. They borrowed that from the EU, the ECB, and, and the IMF. Opinion polls suggest the gap between Syriza and the conservative New Democracy Party, which heads the current government, is widening, and such that the numbers so far are showing Syriza will be the new governing party after we hear the final results for certain tomorrow. Syriza has moderated its stance since the, the peak of the Eurozone crisis and says it wants 
Greece to stay in the euro, but critics say that what the party is advocating may mean Greece will be forced to leave the eurozone, whether it wants to or not. Mr. Tsipras has vowed to renegotiate the bailout agreements and to restructure uh, our, the country's debt, which is currently, again, as we mentioned earlier, 175% of gross domestic product. Now, cafe owner, a cafe owner in uh, Italy says that Europe is ready to listen after all these years. Welcome to drama, small town conservative Greece, but even here it feels like support for the radical left alternative for Syriza is on the rise. Like everywhere else in Greece, this town's been hit hard by five years of austerity. This coffee shop is one of the few places that's actually opened up for business in the last few months. And the man who took the plunge is Yanis Sakiris, known nice as John to his English mates. Nice uh, to meet you. You came back here from Manchester yes. six months ago, back to your hometown. Yes, six months ago, yes. What's it like here in Drama? How, how badly has it been hit by the crisis? Well, it was hit really hard from the crisis and it was a really bad surprise for me when I came back. Um, the unemployment is high, there's no jobs, even the income of the people has been slashed, and it's really, really difficult to make any business to make any profits anymore. It's, it's like a very, was looking like mud people trying to open a cafe in this town now. So we took our gamble, it's a gamble, business is a gamble, but uh, it's not good, the environment is not good at all. And is that why support for Syriza, not just here, but nationwide, seems to be rising? Because people feel, we've tried everything else and it hasn't worked. Well, yes, that's, that's, a, that's right. People is trying now a different approach, a different idea. I don't know if it's going to happen, you know, if it's actually going to make sense, all these things, but people is ready to try. But you, you say you took a gamble opening this business. A lot of people say it could be a gamble for Greece to choose Syriza. There have been kind of threats, haven't there, from politicians abroad. Are, are people listening to that? Well, it used to, in the uh, last elections in 2012, people has been threatened by that. They actually believe the government that actually if Syriza comes to power, suddenly will be no fuel, no money, uh, you know, this... Um, uh, and kicked out of the Eurozone, it, that's they the, say. another threat as well. I don't really believe that people believe anymore that we will be kicked out from Europe or from uh, Eurozone. Europe is ready to listen, I believe, after all these years of failed, absolutely failed measures to listen to Greece. And I think Syriza will be the one which is actually going to make some decent proposals, logical uh, proposals, in order to listen to us. We need different approach, we need different things, we need new ideas, because like this, it's a matter of time to go bankrupt. And we're here in drama. It feels like an appropriate name for it current is. events. Well, this used to be a joke all days, but now it's actually, uh, that's reality. The situation here is really bad, and we've been hit more than any other town uh, in the north, because Bulgaria is next to us, the um, tax there is far less. All the businesses from here that went over there, the, those who actually stayed here went bankrupt. There is, we've got the higher percentage of unemployment in this town. There is no jobs. There is no opportunities. People is going abroad. It's going to Germany, going to England, going everywhere because there is no chance to stay here to make some decent living. You know, what happened with the measures from the European Union and the previous government is the decency of the people. They lost the decency, you know, to live like a human being, to have food, pay the bills, not making money, just living decent. This has been lost. People are not able to pay the, the, you know, the, way, the, the bills, electricity, or taxation. Taxation went five times up. I mean, we're not Monaco, okay? We're, we're in, in a far north corner of Greece. It's really, really difficult for us. And we need to try something else because this way, this town will be a village 10 years later. Because the people is living the town. Serena Fritz is to win the vote. Uh, you can hear you heard some good reasons why uh, in this video interview with the Italian cafe owner. Uh, but without outright majority, uh, they're tipped to win, but without an outright majority. And analysts say the party may struggle to find a coalition partner. 
Mr. Cipras has said he will not govern with those who support what he called the policies of Chancellor Merkel. Germany is seen in Greece as taking the hardest line on its debt. Earlier this month, a spokesman for Mrs. Merkel said Germany expected Greece to uphold the terms of its international bailout agreement. And, friends, we're going to turn to something of a little different nature tonight. We try to cover the whole gamut. That's what's happening in Greece, very important, will have impact on how the EU shapes around. And it'll be interesting to see just where things go with this new party that looks like it's coming in to power uh, in Greece. And again, results we'll know for sure tomorrow, but the numbers are very strongly indicating that Syriza will be the new party in power but with, with problems as, as indicated, perhaps putting together a coalition uh, government. All right, this next story relates to, uh, let's, let's take a look at our chart. I think, well, yeah, we've got some of our new camera shots so that we're able to get uh, get our chart back up on the screen. The second seal from the book of Revelation is the, uh, see, is this the one that takes it in closer? Yeah, this is, the, is, in the, is uh, pictured in Revelation as a red horse, which Jesus Christ described in plain language in Matthew 24 and in the parallel chapters, Luke 21 and Mark 13, as war and rumors of war and third horse famine and the fourth horse disease epidemics primarily, the Greek word loimos meaning disease epidemics, pestilence, the plagues of Egypt, and also seismos, uh, seism seismic activity, uh, commotions in the air, commotions on the ground, and as a third term, Jesus Christ mentioned in relation to things that would happen between the third seal and the fifth seal, tarake, meaning trouble, but not the major trouble, not the great trouble, not the great tribulation of the fifth seal. But under that, uh, under that term he used for loimas, pestilence, uh, disease epidemics, uh, a team set out uh, this weekend on Saturday on a final leg of a mission to eradicate rats from the island of South Georgia with the aim of reclaiming the island for its seabirds. Their ship, loaded with three helicopters and almost 100 tons of poisoned rat bait, sets sail for the Falkland Islands. A magical and unique piece of UK territory. South Georgia, an island off the Antarctic Peninsula, is home to vast colonies of king penguins and seals. But its smaller, feathered residents have a very destructive enemy. Rats, introduced to the island by humans two centuries ago, are estimated to have wiped out 90% of the island's seabirds. And the mission setting sail today is the third and final phase of the largest rat eradication project ever attempted. The team from the South Georgia Heritage Trust will ship three helicopters and 100 tonnes of poisoned rat bait to the island. From mid-February, and when the weather permits, they'll fly back and forth, carefully spreading the bait over every inch of rat-infested territory. Vast glaciers that segment South Georgia, which the rats can't cross, have enabled the team to tackle the job in three distinct phases. Once this third and final part of the mission is complete, they'll carefully monitor over the coming years and even decades to make sure this Antarctic wildlife haven has been reclaimed from the rats. Saudi Arabia is warning for King Abdullah. Thursday. His funeral was taking place in uh, Riyadh before a burial in an unmarked grave in keeping with the kingdom's strict Muslim traditions. His half-brother, Salman, has been confirmed as his successor in his first televised address. 
the new king said there'd be no change of direction in the oil-rich kingdom. He also called for unity in the Islamic world. The BBC's Frank Gardner looks at King Abdullah's legacy. Passed away at 90, Saudi Arabia's King Abdullah died of pneumonia early today. For over 10 years, he's managed the world's biggest oil-producing and exporting country, home to the two holiest sites in Islam. In this deeply conservative and traditional kingdom, Abdullah wove a careful path between modernizing the country and not upsetting the powerful religious clergy. Overcoming their opposition, he gave women more political and economic opportunities. He also tried to curb corruption and excessive waste in his own extended royal family. Yet Saudi Arabia remains out of step with most of the rest of the world, forbidding women from driving and applying draconian punishments. It's used anti-terrorism laws to lock up its critics. Some question why Britain and the West have such a close relationship with a country with such poor human rights. Saudi Arabia is a family-run country, the only one in the world named after the ruling family. The late king's half-brother, Salman, has become the new king. His son, Mohammed, is the new defense minister. Fellow rulers have begun arriving today to pay their respects. No one expects dramatic changes from the new king, who is 79 and very much part of the old establishment. His immediate priority will be ensuring stability and avoiding any family squabbles spilling into the public glare. It is a family business. One's not going to see enormous changes, and, and these sons themselves are in their 50s and 60s and already working as senior ministers. So I don't think we can expect revolutionary changes. never the same way. There are numerous challenges facing Saudi Arabia. It's declared war on the jihadists of Islamic State to the north. Its warplane joined the US-led coalition in bombing IS positions in Syria. This is deeply unpopular with some cities who think their government is taking the wrong side. Ten years ago, the country faced a emergency by al-Qaeda, suicide bombings and shootings. King Abdullah labeled them deviant, and government-appointed clerics have declared Islamic State an enemy of Islam. With violent jihadism on the right across the region, there are fears of terror itself, multiple attacks against both policemen and Western patriots. This country faced a major image as international outrage erupted over the thousand lash sentence and it found an honorable critic calling for peaceful reform. For human rights campaigners, all these reforms did not go nearly far enough. The King Dullah's um, legacy is hardly flowing when we're talking about human rights. Uh, uh, endemic torture in police cells and in uh, prisons. A woman of course aren't even allowed to drive a car without the fear of arrest. Uh, we have a case of Ray Badawi, the blogger and uh, priest activist who, of course, is in jail facing a 10 year sentence, 1,000 lodges in the public square. So, very, very poor human rights record indeed. In accordance with Islamic custom, King Abdullah is better today. He leaves behind a rich country directions towards past traditions and towards the modern world. The new king needs to tread carefully to find the right path between the two. Thank you. And friends, as uh, they say so long to King Abdullah, we'll say so long uh, to you on, for tonight. That's it for our Sunday night edition. Thanks for joining me, God willing, and the creek don't rise. We'll be back again tomorrow evening, Monday evening, with the day's current news related to the Bible and prophecy here on Nightcast. Until next time, your host, Stephen Lloyd Gilbreth, saying so long and good night, friends. You have been watching Nightcast with Stephen Lloyd Gilbreth. Nightcast can be seen Sunday through Thursday nights here on COGTV.org. Tonight's program is also available anytime on demand in the COGTV.org video archive.